This is a National Park Service headquarters for the Minuteman Missile Silo exhibit. Uh, it's at exit 131, I believe, on Interstate 90, uh, either way from east or west. The missile silo that's on display is at exit 116 back down the road. But you really can't see a lot. You can just go peer in the top of the missile and um, you pretty much see that anywhere. This is where you can actually get in the capsule. During the wintertime, they offer tours at 10 and 2, uh, and they don't roll early. There's about a billion vehicles out here, but they don't seem to be anxious to let you in early. They want to stick to the time. Today's a Friday, so they're really not anxious to do anything. They have a 12-minute video that you can watch inside. It is probably available online, but I haven't looked at it. But it looks like a, just a hodgepodge of stuff you've probably already seen. The tour starts at 10 o'clock, and it is uh, around 9.15 now, so we're looking at about another 45 minutes before we roll out there. I'm going to go inside and see how long the tour takes. Um, maybe get some video inside. There's not a lot to see. Um... And I don't know how far the launch control facility is. Launch control facility is really what I want to see anyway, um, because you can actually go in and see that. A lot smaller than the Atlas capsule and a lot smaller than uh, Titan sites, uh, as far as the capsule size itself and the size of the site. The missiles are spread out a little farther, and they're, of course, remotely activated. You don't have to be on site like you did with the liquid-fueled rockets to fuel them and get them erect. They could pop the covers and pop out of the ground and be away right away. Um, killing time, waiting on the tour to start. This is a Badland trading post. And you could get coffee or whatever you wanted while you were waiting. Just a convenience store. You can see out in the prairie though. get a clear shot of it somewhere around here. This is more what you wanted for the solid fueled rockets so that you wouldn't worry about them blowing up the town. The um, Atlases and the Titans were a lot closer in. This is about 60 or 70 miles out from the support base of Ellsworth. Uh, there were 150 missiles out here at the height of the war and of course there's none now. No, none in South Dakota. That's about what the crews had to look to and look for. And I really don't see, um, wasn't a lot to do out here. And they didn't come in and out on Chopper like they said they did in the movies. Let's get a clear shot. Can't get it to focus very well. I think it has something to do with the trees and the way we're turning the focus um, beam, but um, we'll zoom in and focus. You can see how the Pirari pioneers got just bored and went crazy out here like Dancing with Wolves, which is also filmed along this highway somewhere. Uh, like I said, this is about 70 miles out of the support base. Okay, we're following the park ranger out of the side, out of the contact point. And we're going to head back up the interstate, which means I'm going to put this camera down so I'm not doing a big, huge safety thing. And we're going to head out to the launch control facility. We're actually getting out a few minutes early, which is kind of nice. Um, let me just put this thing down before I have a big brick. You can see the launch control facility over the edge of the horizon over that hill. It comes and goes into view. Of course, it was constructed before the interstate was here. Launch control facility is right there. You see they had an old C-band satellite dish. Uh, retention, if you call it a sewage lagoon. There it is.
Emergency escape hatch. Wreck field. C-band satellite dish. Control vehicle. And our park ranger that does a guided tour. Okay, so when you look around the site, there are a few things that you're just like, well, why in the world would they have that kind of thing here in a nuclear missile site? One is the basketball hoop. There's also a volleyball court right over here. And behind the keys, peacekeeper um, is horseshoe pit. And, of course, that big white dish. Everybody know what that is? C-band satellite dish for TV like we used to have in our backyards where TV they scrambled it. we had like dish and all those kind of small ones. Okay, so what happened is uh, all the people that worked here were Air Force people. They all were stationed at Ellsworth Air Force Base. So they would come out, the top side people would come out for a period of three days. They'd work 12 and be off 12. So they had to have something to do while they were, while they were here. Another thing they couldn't do is leave the site. So they couldn't just jump in a vehicle and run the wall and get a coat. They just had to stay here. So all this stuff is just kind of for entertainment, just so they'd have something to do when they weren't working. Something else that you find is really, really important, and there are several different features you can find this way, that will kind of remind us of that. One is that the place had to have, it had to be kind of self-contained. Um, probably one of the most important parts of being self-contained was good communication. And one example of that is this receive antenna out here. Okay? When you look at the bottom of it, you see this big, huge concrete pad, and there are four other round portals around that concrete pad. If this antenna was taken out with a shockwave from an incoming Soviet missile, the missileers downstairs could push a button four separate times and have another antenna come up and replace that one. Mm. There's also an underground communication system that's, that's over there, the big, huge concrete pad. That would come out in the event that other communication methods fail. This is not of the ground at that time. So communication was just really, really important. Now there's another air to ground. You were asking about that. So that's how they communicated with the, either the helicopter or the airplanes, with the air to ground uh, communication with, the, with that. Uh, Did that an, was that an antenna that came up, or just that? No, no, that's, no, that's the that's antenna it. itself? No, nope, it just stayed just like that. That's how they communicated with, uh, with the helicopters and the airplanes. Yeah. Okay, um, let me see. Another feature, the, the peacekeeper, uh, that vehicle was made to prevent uh, anybody getting hurt from small arms. It, it didn't have anything to do, it couldn't protect you from a nuclear blast, but uh, so say they get an alarm out of one of the missile silo sites. That means there's somebody or something, usually birds, out there moving around. So what would happen is the missileers downstairs got an alarm, they send out some security people, and that's the vehicle that they could have driven out in. They had certain procedures they would follow once they got there, as far as approaching and deeming that the site is safe and nobody had, had gotten in. Um, so along with being self-contained then, um, they had their own water well, they had their own sewage lagoon, their own generator in case the power went out. Um, and a helispot landing pad to bring in a helicopter in the event of an emergency um, or bad weather. They couldn't get the crews rotated. So pretty much self-contained, ready for anything, really. All right, we'll walk down this way a little bit. So this whole site was designed to have 10 people, in general, staying here. There would be eight people topside and two downstairs. Now, the eight people topside, I already told you they'd stay here for three days at a time, um, working 12 hour shifts. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get inside, and this will we'll take a look at the living quarters where they would have actually stayed while they were working. Was there another fence around here, or was this the extent of the fence? This is it. Another thing about technology at this time, there were no cameras here that the Air Force had. It was all line of sight and all personnel. Well, that's a high spot, so you can see quite a way. They did that on purpose too. Yes, yeah. so you could see, you could see people coming or going from the interstate. No, except for this guy. Okay, so he's the guy that has his own room. 
So, you know, that he must be a little bit more important. This was the facility manager. So his job was to make sure the grass got cut, the snow got plowed, the electricity stayed on, the plumbing stayed uh, working, the generator stayed working. So pretty responsible guy. So he had the same shift as everybody else. He was on for three days. Um, however, he was subject to all is uh, to make sure their weapons were unloaded. So what happened is the Air Force gave these guys four pages of instruction on how to unload their weapon. All right, when they got done with all these instructions, they pulled the trigger and their weapon should go click and not bang. <laughs> However, if it did go bang, then the bullet would end up in this, this barrel of sand. It would, however, cost them something if it went bang. <laughs> I've heard a stripe is what, what in general would cost them. <laughs> yeah, not something you'd want to deal. Okay. Okay, so we're going down 31 feet. Not all capsule depths were the same. The capsule depths vary by soil composition. The more clay in the soil, the less deep the capsule, the more sand in the soil, the deeper the capsule was. Now, I'll remind you again, when we get down here, please don't touch any of the artwork. It is all original. The concrete that you see is all three to four foot thick with uh, one inch rebar in it. But this whole thing was designed to withstand not a direct hit, but a near miss. A direct hit would have put a big hole in the ground. Okay. So you see the uh, Soviet flag with the, with the missile through it? And then also you saw a picture of this before at, the, at our office. This is the, the uh, blast door. It weighs eight tons. Can you move it though relatively easy? One, with one hand. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little harder to stop. You <laughs> have it on and just got a heat spot. That's why you have the big huge door stop over there. It is blocked so we can't move it now. Just oh, okay. for the safety of the, the resort. Two times. Getting the meals in here and changing shifts. So once a day they don't. Okay, so the crew was not the only one down here. Right, that is true. Okay, yeah. I thought they were the only one in here. They didn't go in the capsule? Yeah, they just because came they to the door. Because they didn't have the correct clearance, the yeah. proper clearance to get through the door. That's right. Um, across this line is when there was at least two of you. So this sign goes with that no loan zone, two man concept mandatory. Okay. Um, one other thing I'd like to show you is a egg-shaped capsule that we just looked at in the construction photo. The hallway wow. that we walk through is the thickness of that capsule, right? Wow. This is the air handling system. This is the ventilation system that we talked about and looked at. Hmm. And then also when you look at these corners it's here, you see... Hydraulic ram. Yes. <clears throat> now what they are is um, shock isolators. And huh. what they are, <clears throat> there's four of them. And what it does, they're filled with compressed air with two foot in any direction and without affecting operations inside. Wow. That's why you have this little hump here. And then watch your step here um, on this railing. And uh, this particular thing does not have anything to do with our site. This is how we show um, school kids what a capsule. Okay, and so these guys' entire job down here, what their, what their whole mission was, was to launch nuclear weapons. And of course, over the whole period of time, the 30 plus years that this site was operational, that never happened. But in the event that it did, the way that it would go down is uh, the orders would come from SAC. 